welcome to Mums at the Table. How are you, Shona? I'm good, and this is Rachel. <laughs> Me, myself and, and I. I. <laughs> Good to see you looking well. Coming up today, we've got Amanda who's going to talk about nutrition with Gia and we've got Dr Simone who's our GP. Don't forget, if you've got questions you want to ask them, send them in. We are more than happy to pass those along. Well, she's going to answer them. Yeah, but we can pass That's the, the questions on. Oh, OK. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Sharon. <laughs> so today we're talking about only children and did you feel the pressure to have more? Because I'm seeing it, it's becoming a little more common just to have yeah. one child. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, I mean, you can easily see why today it is incredibly expensive to have children. It's, it's, it's mentally draining, yeah, it's emotionally physically taxing. draining, it's emotionally taxing. All of those things. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, are people feeling the pressure to have more because of society, because of the questions that people ask them? I'm when not, are you having another one? Yeah, <laughs> and, and that's something we faced uh, once we'd had the two, our two boys. Mm -hmm. Um, people kept coming up to us saying, oh, you've, you've got two boys, when are you going to have a girl? And I'm like, <laughs> guys, dude, look, you know, can't you see I'm under a lot enough stress? We, we don't have this? a say in it. Mm, <laughs> no. And look, you know, we, we've got three girls and we have had the same question asked of us, are you going to try for a boy? And, yeah. you know, it, it's, I guess it's a fun question to ask, but no, no, the stress on the face should have given the clear answer there. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, if we're struggling with that question when we've got, you know, larger families, mm. if you class two as a larger family. Imagine how people are feeling when they've got an only child, they can't, you know, can't have another one for whatever reason, and somebody's asking them that question. Mm. That's... You know, and, and it does depend on the relationship. If you have a close relationship mm. with someone, you can ask those sorts of questions or have those discussions. But just to make up conversation for the sake of it, I think we need to think before we speak, speak. when it comes yeah. to that because you don't know why someone may have one. It might be a personal choice and that's just what they want, you know, that yeah. you don't know if they're struggling to have kids. Yeah. You don't know the scenarios yeah, going on They might be the financially yeah. unable to have any more. That's right. And I think... In a, I guess there's that similar scenario of women who are actually choosing not to have kids. Mm. But I'm watching social media and I've seen some really brutal comments about why wouldn't you want a, a child? Isn't that, you know, part of who you... Isn't like, it as selfish a woman, is it... not to have children <laughs> and not to have another one when you've already got one? And, yeah, we can be pretty harmful to other people. You know, I guess it is a good idea to think before we say those things instead of just making something up for the sake of conversation. Mm. But what's your experience been? Have you felt the pressure, um, if you only have one child, to have more? Or have you been an only child and what's your circumstance been? We'd love to hear from you on our social media. Hey, thanks for keeping it locked right here on Mums at the Table. I'm sitting with Dr Simone and we're going to be talking about urinary tract infection. UTIs in children, mm. it happens. It happens. It's not the most common thing that happens to children, but it definitely does happen. So the, kink, the things to look out for is if your child has a temperature that you can't really find another reason for. They're not no. snotty, they're not coughing, they're not pulling at an ear and it's not getting better. Does it come on suddenly? Like all of a sudden they, t they just get a temperature? It can and... do, it can yeah. do, or it can be a bit of a grumbling thing that goes in the background and you go, why isn't my kid perking out? Why isn't my kid right. picking up from what seems to be a little bit of a bug that they've got? OK. 38.5? Um, yeah, that's, um, that's about the right temperature to be interested in. Right. There's a couple of groups of children that are a bit more susceptible to urinary tract infections. Yes. So... Um, any, any baby who has had any identified kidney or bladder abnormalities during right. the course of pregnancy, normally around about the 19, 20-week anatomy scan, those sorts of things can okay. get picked up then. Those children you do need to be particularly mindful of in terms of keeping a lookout for any unexplained fevers. So, so important, I guess, as mums or as dads, just to remember if they have had that um, happen in their, their, during their pregnancy, and their child develops... Keep it on the radar. ...temperatures later on. Keep it in the back of your mind because yeah, it could be a UTI. Yeah, absolutely. Right. The things that we can do to, I guess, ur urinary tract infections are less likely if our children are really well hydrated. And oh, so okay. if it's been a really hot period of time yes. or if your child hasn't been drinking as much, then that can be a little bit of a, uh, a, little bit of a risk factor. And so keeping being really conscious of your kid's fluid intake... So it's not contagious, thing. is it? It's not contagious? Not like a cold or, a, or, a, right. or, a, or those sorts of things are contagious, no. Is it anything to do with the hygiene or...? So what, especially as... Uh, so more, that's more applicable to little girls and right. especially as they get older, it's really important... That that, we, that, we, that we're very diligent mm -hmm. in teaching our little girls that you know, when you're going to the bathroom, always wipe from the front 
to the back right. and then you discard your toilet paper and those yep. sorts of things. So and, and even not to hold. Absolutely. Don't, go to the toilet. Yes, don't, don't not go to the toilet if yep. you need to go to the toilet, absolutely. Right. Is there anything that we can do as parents to prevent um, our children from getting UTIs? So keeping sure that, making sure that your kids are really well hydrated. Right. Um, teach them the hygiene practices that are, that are so important in terms of reducing the risk. And if you and be, be vigilant, be, be vigilant for watching out for the signs if there are any things that aren't settling down, as you would normally expect a, right. a snotty nose or a cough or a cold to do, then get them to the doctor and get them checked out. And, and, and I guess a key thing is watching that temperature. If yeah. it's not going down and you're giving them Panadol or Nurofen or treating them in some way yeah. and it's still not going down... Then get it checked out. Get it checked out. The other and the other thing to say with that is that if your child has one or two bladder ur urinary tract infections, that's probably unlucky. Yeah. But if they're having recurrent infections, if they're having them every month right. or if they just does, don't seem to be getting over them, then that's also worth a conversation with your doctor about. Yeah, look, such in insightful information. Thank you so much, Dr Simone. I'm sure that's helped you at home. Don't forget to keep it locked right here, Mums at the Table, and subscribe to our YouTube channel for great topics like this and more. We're here again with Amanda, our dietitian. Hello, Amanda. Hi, Gia. Thank you for coming again today. We have a very interesting topic today for me because I can see she's got all these plant milks here. There's so many different plant milks out there and it's so hard to choose which one's the right plant milk, isn't it? That's right, yeah. And so we've asked Amanda, because some of the viewers have asked this question, how they want to know a little bit about the different plant milks and which ones are probably better to yeah. have. Yeah, yeah. So if you could basically maybe even tell us a little bit about each one that you've got here, yeah, that well, would be awesome. let's start with this one. So this is soy milk and it is actually the most comparable to cow's milk in terms of its energy, protein and nutrient content. It also has the highest amount of protein in it of all the plant milks. Okay. It's low in saturated fat and and has a good amount of monounsaturated fats and polyunsaturated fats, so it's good for heart health as well. That's awesome. So, soy milk. so awesome. for children, this is the best one to choose because of the energy and protein which they need for growth. The next one is oat milk. So this one is the next highest in protein and it actually has slightly higher energy content than the soy milk does. Oh. Yeah. Okay. And it's got the most fibre out of all of the plant milks as well. So oat milk has the most fibre. I like that. That's <laughs> right. It's low in saturated fat and it, and it naturally has some B vitamins in it too. Nice. So if you don't like the taste of soy and you're not looking for a low energy milk, then this is a reasonable one to try too. Awesome. Oat milk. The next is almond milk. So this one has the least amount of energy of all of the milks and mm. it's also low in protein too. It's got, it's low in saturated fat as well and it's high in monounsaturated fat. So again, good for heart health. Right. This, this is one, the one I drink. Yeah, well, this is a good one to have if you are wanting to try and lose a bit of weight or on a lower energy diet. Just make sure that you are getting your protein from other sources. Right. The next one is rice milk. So this one has comparable energy levels to cow's milk um, and that's because of its high carbohydrate content and it has actually a high amount of natural sugars in it too. Right. So what happens is when the rice is processed, the carbohydrates in them break down into sugars. Right. So it gives it that sweet flavour but it's also got a high glycemic index so not really suitable for diabetics. So your kids will go hypo. Yeah, <laughs> it's, also, it's also low in fat and low in protein and when unfortified, very low in vitamins and minerals. So not the best option for most people. Right. And then lastly is coconut milk. So this one is also low in energy and pretty much has no protein. It's also high in saturated fat and the evidence is conflicting on this in terms of um, saturated fat from coconuts and heart health. So only have this on an occasional basis. On an occasional. Okay, so we've got the best one at the front and yeah, then we go down. Right, pretty much. That's <laughs> awesome. I hope you can play this back so please subscribe to our YouTube channel and play this back so you can hear more in detail what we just said that's awesome thank you so much no Amanda. Problem. see you next time This next one you're going to love. Dr Wood is sitting here. We're about to have a chat because he's actually just come back from delivering a baby. Now that brings us to our topic because what are we to expect um, once we have a baby once you know Babies out here safely, like as mums. What, it, what it is can you a expect? massive subject, so we'll just try and touch on a few things. Yeah. First thing is, basically, your life is different from now on, right? And that 
change from being able to go out for coffee and yeah. going out to, to watch a movie with, to suddenly having a little human who's 100% dependent on you is a massive change. And it comes with that some issues. So yeah. one is you might find it emotionally challenging. This just change. having to adjust. Yes, yeah, right. Yeah. You know, I always like to think about it that, you know, giving birth just a day. Yes. But after the baby's born, that's when the real hard work is, comes and we often refer to it as the fourth trimester, oh, right? Okay. That 10 week period, even longer. So issues that are happening, breastfeeding. If you can get your head around breastfeeding before the baby's born by going to a breastfeeding class beforehand, it makes that transition really helpful. I did one, I right. would vouch for that, definitely. Breastfeeding class yep. is very important. It is physiological and normal for you to be really emotional two or three days after the baby's born. But if you find that those emotions are really carrying on for yeah. weeks and you're just like baby blues just or, crying or and if you find you're not going out of the house you're not sleeping even though you're tired you're withdrawing from people those are a sign that you may be having an issue and okay. go and see a healthcare practitioner get some help there's plenty out there and it's a lot of people experience those postnatal depression and get some help now and it's really good to sort it out even if a loved one sees it that's right yeah so these changes in you and just yeah. talk openly about it and talk yeah. about the fact you're struggling that is you know normal it's okay to struggle and, it, the struggle is real, that's and, for sure. And by going to a, like a baby, like a, a new mum's class, yes. um, where there's a whole lot of new mums with the same issues, with the community health have them. Um, Helps as well. Being with other mums who are having the same problems is really helpful to just get yourself through. Thirdly, you're going to have a lot of bleeding in those first few days and weeks after baby's <laughs> born. It's pretty hectic, yeah, so yeah. be prepared, get some pretty, um, you know, appropriate sanitary items yeah. ready for yourself That's and wear... Truth. You're not prepared and, and, for that. And That's... wear sensible undies. Yeah. Right? Don't worry, try and be some glamour item at this point. It's all about being comfortable and sensible. That's right. So um, that should taper off after about four to six weeks or right. maybe the a little blood, bit longer. The bleeding. The bleeding. Yeah. If you're still having heavy bleeding or it's yeah. getting worse or you're feeling unwell, you should contact your doctor or your healthcare practitioner straight away. Yeah. Um, so by the postnatal check... Yeah. Your bleeding may because it's about six weeks after. Six weeks, it should almost have finished by then. Yes. Um, and if, if, you're it's if you're breastfeeding, it may go a little bit longer. It's usually browny, sort of really right. old spotting sort of stuff. But if you're having continued heavy, fresh bleeding right. during that time, you should be contacting somebody just to get that checked out. Definitely get yeah. that checked out. So look, when this time comes, the best way to manage it is actually to be prepared before it all happens. Okay. Things you can do: try and go to a breastfeeding class before they give birth. Yes. Try and surround yourself with people that love you and support you, particularly your parents Side and mums. Point. It's crazy how much having someone make meals or clean your house for you can really support you in this post yeah. in this postpartum time. Yeah. And just go with the flow. Don't try and achieve everything. One day at a time, even one feet at a time, it. is the best clue. I love that advice. Thank you so much, Dr Peter Wood, for sharing that. I hope that's helped you. Um, and look, keep it locked right here at Mums at the Table and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Okay, I am the least tech savvy person <laughs> around here. For me, I don't even, I didn't even know what a upload and a download and a cloud and everything else was. <laughs> and now we've got Fs and we've got Bs and we've got Nils and IMOs and all these sorts of <laughs> and things. And a whole heap more. My head just explodes <laughs> with all of this stuff. My question to you today, and maybe the ladies out there can answer it as well, has the internet change the way we communicate? Oh, undoubtedly. Absolutely it has. Uh, like, And I have to confess, I feel like I'm not far behind you. I'm not really tech savvy. It's not my spiritual <laughs> gift at all. I'll say the wrong thing and embarrass my sister who does apparently know the right stuff anyway. Um, it has to have changed the way yes. we talk. When you speak to a person, it's always really different to how you write yeah. to someone and write, you know, that's the old fashioned way, yeah, yeah. Text, text, you know, email, whatever, um, messenger, etc. So definitely, but has it changed it for the better or the worse? Well, because there'll be generations who go worse for sure. Yeah, I'm I'm one of those generations okay. <laughs> because I'm one of the ones that you know you walk into a room and there's this room full of early young adults or teens and they're all on their phones. Mm. They're not communicating, and it for me it's just we've lost the skill of how to talk to one another. You can read an email or a text and you you I'm trying to guess are they happy with me? <laughs> are they angry with me? Half the emo emojis. I, 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 I love emojis. <laughs> Because in one small space they can say what you're thinking unless you press the wrong one. <laughs>
<laughs> and my kids are always saying to me, please, Mum, don't talk to me on Messenger and don't talk to me on Instagram. <laughs> so Ouch. I'm, I'm completely lost in this whole world of communication unless I'm talking face to face yeah. and I can see your eyeballs. But that's something you grew up with. That's a yes. natural thing. That's a skill. Whereas we've got a generation coming through with a completely different communication. Well, lots of generations of that are coming yeah. through with it now. And so there's all these shortcuts, there's these abbreviations, yes. and we're trying to sort of marry the two, gener like all the generations, to try and understand yeah. that. But I also feel like there's a component where people feel way too confident online to say stuff, but they're protected by the yes. fact that they're behind that screen, that no one can see them. And I don't know that that communication is effective or uplifting. And they're not held accountable for what they're saying because they're hidden behind that screen. They can say That's whatever the they want mm. and not actually understand that it's still hurting somebody's feelings. Yeah. So that, there's it. the way we communicate that's changed, but mm -hmm. the type of communication and the type of connections and relationships that we're also having as well. So we can sort of model to our kids, yes, we're going to talk to this person, but the reality is there is so much in our society that is electronic that mm. is just barraging the way they're learning to communicate as well. And you've got schools who are introducing screens. Oh. Now the debate's actually going out where schools are actually trying to so get, get rid, rid of those of screens, even though they've brought them in. So yeah. there's... There's a, I think the, de the debate and the research is still sort of happening in that quadrant. Um, but, yeah, communication is key. You know, we say that over a lot of topics we discuss, that communication is key. Yes, we yeah. do. But that is all we've got time for today. We would love to hear from you. If you've got something you would like us to discuss or if you've got a question for one of our experts, please jump onto our social media. We've got Dr Simone who'd love to answer your question, our nutritionist Amanda and Fiona always um, sits down and has a good ch chat to Colleen, Colette, about <laughs> wellbeing. I've joined those. I better go. I think we're done here. Yeah, we're done. <laughs> See Bye. You next time. Bye.